So I have nothing to disclose, and we will be talking about the use of gadolinium for cardiac MRI, which is an off-label use. Now, in terms of our learning objectives, we're going to start off by looking at multimodality imaging of the aorta, including the advantages and disadvantages of each modality. We'll begin exploring some cases regarding various aortic pathologies with the caveat that I won't be discussing acute aortic syndromes in this talk. Um, there's simply too much to cover and most of those are gonna be acute things that are gonna go towards the operating room. So we're gonna focus more on some of the other issues with the aorta. And then lastly, we'll review indications and timing of surgery for ascending aortic aneurysms depending upon the pathology. So thoracic aortic aneurysms are typically found um, incidentally, and patients are usually asymptomatic. Um, so often patients may have a PE study, shows the ascending aorta is dilated, or some other issue, um, CT chest for following up a lung nodule. Um, and so often we find these, and the question is, well, what do we do with them? Ultimately, the etiology determines the management of the patient as well as their family members. Elective intervention is clearly much lower risk in the setting of acute aortic syndromes. And so when you've got a patient with an incidentally diagnosed ascending aortic aneurysm, the question is, well, what do you do? And the first question is, well, why is the aorta dilated? Is it involving the root, the mid-level, the arch? Is it a bicuspid aortic valve? Are the patients older? We know that as age goes up, the aorta size goes up. We'll talk a little bit about that. What are the other risk factors? Smoking, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, connective tissue disease, aortitis, or family history? The next question is, should we get extra imaging? Was this an echo? Was it a CTMR? What else do we need to do? Or is it time for surgery now? And if it is time for surgery, what type of operation are we going to be doing? So we're gonna start off with our cases. We start with a 73 year old male who presents with a screening echocardiogram for a cardiac murmur. He's got the usual risk factors of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, prior tobacco use, and he has no family history of aortic dissection or aortic aneurysm. His physical exam shows a grade two of six systolic murmur, doesn't radiate to the carotid, it's all consistent with aortic valve sclerosis. And these are the measurements when we get when we're assessing his aorta. So his sinus of Valsalva measures 40, his mid-ascendant aorta measures 44 millimeters. Now, one of the things that I do like to highlight on this is this area that we have circled, the right peristernal window. And in particular, this is something whenever you have a patient with a dilated aorta, you should be instructing your sonographers to obtain. And this case shows exactly why. So this is this patient. You can see here on his chest x-ray, he has a very uh, tortuous aorta, really kind of wraps around to the right side of the sternum. And when we look at a CT scan of the same patient, you can quickly see that if you're trying to image only from the left peristernal window, you're not going to be able to see the full extent of the aorta. And so you're often gonna be cutting it as you're trying to turn the probe and get the maximum window. But if your sonographer does a right peristernal window, you've got a beautiful view of that ascending aorta. And so in our practice, if you've got an aorta that appears to be dilated, often we will have the sonographers make sure they get a right peristernal view just to make sure you're not missing the true extent of dilatation. And so the next question comes up, hey, mid ascending aorta is 44 millimeters. Is the aorta dilated for this patient? And for the longest time, we had nomograms such as this. Um, this is currently what the guidelines suggest, um, where they have basically kids, people 20 to 39, adults greater than 40. And you would simply take the body surface area, go across from the ascending aorta and say, does it fall within this realm? Um, but I think a change that will make it to the guidelines in the future and something that I would refer you all to is a paper um, done by Dr. Spatel from our group in 2018, where they really tried to create some reference values of the mid ascending aorta based upon a patient's age and decade of life. So these are the two charts from it. Women are on the left, men are on the right. And ultimately, you can see that over time, as each decade of life occurs, the ascending aorta sizes continue to go up. And so one of the complexities of this that, that caused for us in our lab is that we would have patients who were said, dilated ascending aorta 44 millimeters, dilated ascending aorta 44 millimeters for years. And then they come back for their next check and we say normal mid ascending aorta size. Um, and we had to really sort of reference that with our internal medicine colleagues to say, hey, we now have new reference values. For this reason, the patient does have a normal aorta and maybe they don't need to be screened as often as what they were being screened before. Um, so I think this is a really good paper, something that you could um, take home with you and really just sort of print out, keep up on a wall and, and have available. 
So when do we get extra images? For me, I think the biggest thing is, do you believe the echo measurements or not? I think we've all seen some images where it's a little bit turned, a little bit rotated. You're like, am I opening this up completely? Um, in particular, anyone who's getting near surgical intervention, I would say it's time to get an extra modality just to confirm where you're at. Looking at other parts of the aorta that we're not seeing on echo, <clears throat> great shots of the root, mid ascending aorta, distal aortas, plus or minus, depending on where you're at. Often can see the arch well, but descending thoracic aorta is not shown well. And so again, that would be another reason. If you Again, if you think there's an acute aortic syndrome, often we'll get extra imaging. For preoperative assessment, um, honestly, for some of our younger patients, um, for all of our mitral valve repairs for the most part, um, we use diagnostic CT angiography to clear the coronaries and our surgeons are quite comfortable with that and taking them to the operating room. And lastly, to evaluate for evidence of aortitis. So one of the questions that comes up is which modality and why? <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk through a few points, but for MRI and MRA, the advantage is no radiation exposure can be done with or without gadolinium contrast. And so one of the things that I was really surprised with when I started my training is how beautiful some of the images you can get without any gadolinium contrast on MRI. So you can actually get a pretty good view of the aorta without contrast. You can also evaluate left ventricular size, function, um, evaluate for valvular heart disease, looking for evidence of aortic regurgitation or aortitis. For CT angiogram, again, the biggest advantage is assessment of the coronary arteries and also is much better at evaluating for complex dissections or in particular, if you have any endovascular stents, MRI is going to have a lot of susceptibility artifact. And so you want to stay away from those patients who might have already had a descending thoracic aortic intervention. And lastly, PET, is it going to be used predominantly for aortitis or any evidence of graft or valve infections? Now, what are our disadvantages to these modalities? So MRI, um, gadolinium in general is contraindicated for patients with an EGFR of less than 30. There's some recent literature that says maybe we're being a bit too aggressive with that. Um, an alternative agent that we use is ferrahem. So this is iron um, that we give IV typically for patients with chronic renal disease, but it actually is a great MRI tracer um, because it stays in the blood pool and doesn't enhance a lot. And so actually we do a fair amount of studies um, with ferrahem if a patient does have a low EGFR. Um, these are time consuming studies. I don't know how many people have actually watched an MRI take place, but in general, patients are in the scanner for anywhere between 30 minutes to an hour and a half if it's a full MRI of the heart. Um, and half that time, the images aren't even being obtained. The patient's just simply trying to catch their breath from having to hold it for 15 to 20 seconds at a time. So about half the time, we're not actually scanning a patient actively. Um, they're very breath dependent and can be affected by irregular rhythm. So people with atrial fibrillation, particularly the root, because that's gonna be the area that moves the most. And the other big thing is cost and specialized care. Um, I've been as a fellow called, hey, can we get a stat MRA of the chest overnight? It's a little bit harder to explain to people that it's not as easy as getting a stat brain MRI. The brain doesn't move, the heart does. And so there's a lot of extra factors that techs have to be trained by. For CT angiogram, again, everyone knows aeronated contrast may cause acute kidney injury um, and ECG gating remains critical, which we'll look at. And lastly, PET, the biggest disadvantage is cost. Um, the CT portion typically does not give uh, contrast in it and it may or may not be ECG gated. So when we measure the aorta, we want to measure at reproducible landmarks. And on CT scan or MRI, we measure the external diameter perpendicular to blood flow. And so when we talk about this double oblique imaging, this is what we mean. So we set up one plane um, to be perpendicular to the blood flow. We set up the same color in the same direction perpendicular to blood flow. And that gets us a nice pretty circle. And then we measure on that circle an outer to outer dimension. And so as we go along, we'll change the red line at each part that we're evaluating. When we measure the sinuses, we measure the widest diameter at the mid sinus level. So again, you're gonna be measuring this direction here. And on echo, as everyone knows, we do leading edge to leading edge in diastole. 
The biggest thing is same technique, same location is really critical for these patients. So we all see, you know, one or two millimeter changes, um, and that can be just within the limits of variability between two different readers. But patients really get hung up on, hey, it was 43 millimeters last year, it's 44 millimeters this year, what does this mean for me, doc? Um, so I think it's really important to emphasize to those patients um, that there are some limits to our measurements. Um, this simply just shows the importance of ECG gating studies. So this is a PE study that was done um, in an emergency department. And you can see here, there's just a lot of artifact on the aorta side of things. And this is the exact same patient with a gated study. And you can again see here, just the 3D reconstruction of how much better uh, quality we get. And so you can easily see if you're trying to measure this and compare to this a year ago, ultimately you should say you can't compare it. So ECG gating is particularly critical. Um, and I would argue that we should ECG gate anything that we're imaging within the chest. Lastly, how and, measure you, how and where you measure is important. So again, if we're measuring the sinus of Valsalva here, we're gonna measure that outer, to, sorry, um, leading edge to leading edge, which gives us the sinus of Valsalva 46. If we're measuring on CT or MR, again, we're gonna do maximal sinus dimensions here. And that gets us the sinus of Valsalva 48. And lastly, um, there were some studies, particularly early TAVR studies that measured from a commissure to the opposite sinus. And you can see here, if you're making a measurement such as that, you're really kind of missing what the true uh, size of the sinus of Valsalva is. So we want to avoid measuring such as this. Um, one of the things I do point out is you can tell this is the right cusp here. And so as we do the measurements on uh, echo, we can measure this way, we can measure this way, but you can't ever measure in this direction. So unless you're measuring on short axis, um, which is what ASC guidelines don't recommend, MRI and CT may find a larger size because they can measure something that we can't. So in terms of degenerative aneurysms, the biggest thing is risk factor control blood pressure control, smoking cessation, control on their lipids. And I do uh, generally talk to some of these patients about avoidance of contact activities. It may sound silly for patients with degenerative aneurysms, but some of these patients really love downhill skiing and you have to be really upfront with them about what that means if their aorta is 53 millimeters. Um, also avoiding vigorous Valsalva. So in my younger patients, I do tell them weightlifting is okay, but I want you to really focus on toning. So trying to do multiple reps, not really pushing, straining, trying to get that maximal lift. We really wanna to try to avoid that in patients with dilated aortas. Ultimately considering an extra modality if echo is the initial study. Guidelines say recheck the aorta size in six to 12 months, and then after that yearly. And then if it's stable for several years, you can then push up your screening interval further for degenerative aneurysms. Aortic dilatation um, intervention is 55 millimeters for patients with a degenerative aneurysm. So we'll go to case two here. We have a 74 year old female with an aorta dilatation reassessment. At 72, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. A pre-screening echo showed an aortic aneurysm of 49 millimeters. CT scan a year later was unchanged. CT scan today shows it's now 56 millimeters. She's got some of the typical risk factors, but also has a history of polymyalgia rheumatica on methotrexate and prednisone for the past two years. Her inflammatory markers are undetectable. Um, nothing for connective tissue disease or family history. So again, here we can see the sinus of Alsalva, normal size, but you see some effacement of the sinotubular junction little bit of aortic regurgitation centrally in a trileaflet valve. And at the mid-level, again, we confirm that the ascending aorta measures 56 millimeters. And so one of the questions is, what's the most likely etiology here? So this patient did have rapid expansion, has an indication for moving forward with surgery. Her preoperative inflammatory markers were normal, and she underwent a replacement of the aorta, um, including um, aortic valve resuspension. And her pathology showed evidence of active giant cell arteritis. She was placed on immunosuppression with prednisone and transitioned to one of the monoclonal antibodies afterwards. So aortitis in general is a fairly uncommon cause for aortic aneurysms. Typically, these are going to be infectious causes worldwide, things like syphilis, salmonella, staph, and strep. But for non-infectious causes, if a patient is over the age of 50, we suspect giant cell arteritis, if they're under the age of 50, we suspect Takayasu's arteritis, particularly in um, some of the Eastern countries. 
And so we see here on MRI, this kind of diffuse circumferential thickening. And on MRI, we look for evidence of active edema. And you see, again, this very white uh, border around the aorta. Um, when we look at the active phase on CT, you can again see this very diffuse thickening of the aorta all the way around. And then on PET, we'll see that that lights up with evidence of active inflammation. But in the chronic phase, they will either develop aneurysms, as this patient did, or you can get significant stenosis where you can see this sort of pencil thin brachiocephalic and left common carotid artery takeoffs. Um, in the chronic phase, they're less likely to respond to immunosuppressin, and then more in line of you'll probably have to replace or fix whatever is um, having an issue. Um, giant cell, very briefly, is the most common vasculitis in the elderly. Typically on board exams, we hear about the cranial manifestations. Patients develop sudden vision loss with headaches. But for extracranial, we worry about thoracic aneurysms, arm claudication because of the stenotic phase, or constitutional symptoms. And aortic aneurysms are a late complication. In general, we expect about 39 months before an aortic aneurysm to occur from the time of their initial diagnosis. We'll go to case three now. We have a 24-year-old female with a history of Marfan syndrome. Um, she presents for a screening echo, no family history, exam is normal, and this is her echocardiogram. So we see a sinus of Valsalva measuring 45 millimeters with a Z-score of 3.2. MRI was performed to confirm, and again, sinus of Valsalva measures 45. And so when we look at this patient, she has Marfan syndrome. So for a patient with a positive family history, they require one of these three things, either a Z-score, um, which you can uh, calculate for these patients of greater than two and patients over the age of 20, ectopia lentis, which is a really cool uh, video, but unfortunately because of copyright issues and the fact that we're live streaming this, I'm not able to uh, include it, but I would encourage you all to YouTube ectopia lentis because you'll see patients move their eyes and their lens takes a second to catch up. And so um, very unique feature for patients with Marfan syndrome or a significantly elevated systemic score. I'm not gonna go through the, the no family history, but uh, we'll, we'll keep moving along here to, for the sake of time. Ultimately, we wanna do strict blood pressure control in these patients with Marfan syndrome. All Marfan's patients should be on a beta blocker. All Marfan's patients should be on a beta blocker. This does show that they decrease the rate of aortic aneurysm dilatation. And in patients with Marfan's, ARBs are, are encouraged to be used because this has shown in children to decrease the rate of dilatation. Um, and often they are tend to be better tolerated than beta blocker therapy. However, all patients with Marfan syndrome should avoid calcium channel blockers. And so Marfan treated rice mice with calcium channel blockers show accelerated aneurysm expansion, rupture and premature lethality. And whenever we look at patients with Marfan syndrome or some of the other inherited erotopathies, patients with calcium channel blockers do worse. And so ultimately for these patients, um, calcium channel blockers should be contraindicated. So what are our indications for elective replacement of the aorta? Typically we're targeting an aorta size of five centimeters or 50 millimeters, unless there's evidence of a family history, if they had a dissection less than five, rapid expansion or progressive aortic enlargement, sorry, aortic regurgitation or desire for a valve sparing root. You can think about replacing an aorta if the size is more than four in women who are contemplating pregnancy. Pregnancy leads to a lot of hormonal changes. And with that, we often see a lot of aortas tend to dilate in patients with aortopathy. And um, patients with a cross-sectional area of greater than 10, um, we won't spend much time that. Um, this patient was 24, was married, was planning on having kids, and she ultimately underwent foul sparing root replacement given her ascending aorta size um, of greater than 40 millimeters. So case four, we have a 30-year-old female with a history of a cardiac murmur. She's got a history of scoliosis, pectus deformity, very flexible, can sublux her shoulders and hips. So all of this sort of sounds connected tissue disease. She's had three prior pregnancies with no symptoms. Her mother um, had a family history of an aortic aneurysm, but doesn't know much else outside of that. And she had an echocardiogram ordered, which showed a root measuring 48 millimeters and a trileaflet aortic valve with mild regurgitation. But what do you recommend at this time? An echo in six months, follow up in a year, refer for root replacement, obtain some extra imaging or something else. 
Um, in this case, the patient was recommended to follow up in one year, um, said, you know, your aorta is 48, nothing we need to worry about right now. Didn't offer any genetic testing, no counseling about the risk of pregnancy. And unfortunately, she proceeded with her fourth pregnancy and four months postpartum had rapid onset heart failure. Her echocardiogram now shows an aortic root of more than six centimeters. She's got severe aortic valve regurgitation. Her LV is dilated, her EF is 30%. So she was referred to a valve sparing root replacement, which was performed. She had findings of chronic dissection of her ascending aorta. She had severe aortic valve regurgitation coming off pump. They had to do a second pump run, had difficulty weaning from bypass. Her EF is now 20. She required a balloon pump. And a year later, ultimately had to have a reoperation for aortic valve replacement with a mechanical prosthesis. And you would say this is enough issues for a lifetime, but unfortunately her story continues. Three months later, had acute abdominal pain, ruptured an aneurysm of the right hepatic artery, required some coil embolization, chronic dissection of the SMA, right common iliac artery aneurysms. So again, we're clearly seeing a pattern. And at this point, genetic testing was done and showed that she had a pathogenic SMAD3 mutation. So this is a patient with Lois Dietz. Lois Dietz syndrome is one of the scariest aerotopathies for us. Um, and it's simply because these patients do present with aneurysms, dissections everywhere. And so this is typically either a mutation of the TGFR beta receptor or in type three, the SMAD3 mutation. Um, it's an autosomal dominant inheritance. So 50% of their kids will have this. And ultimately we treat with ARBs to the highest tolerated dose. These patients, again, have increased risk of arterial dissection, even at small diameters. So we intervene on these patients with an ascending aorta of 40 millimeters or more. Um, some of the other features, this bifid uvula, extensive arterial tortuosity, um, cleft palate club feet. Um, and the big thing for these patients is we have to image them from their head to their pelvis with an MRA or CT scan yearly. They simply have too many dissections, aneurysms, things such as that to, to not image them yearly. Um, the other thing for those of us who might be within anesthesia, we get a cervical spine x-ray with flexion and extension views prior to surgery because they have increased atlanoaxial instability. And so when you're intubating these patients, that does have some increased risk as well. In terms of people who have an aer familial aerotopathy, um, we recommend screening first degree relatives and if there is a gene mutation, you can screen with that gene mutation in offspring, because if they don't have that mutation, they should not have the same risk that their parent did. And if you have one or more first degree relatives, then in general, the guidelines say probably screen the second degree relatives as well. So we'll go on to our last case, 29 year old male with congestive heart failure. Echocardiogram was done to assess for that. He's got a bicuspid aortic valve, severe sinus of valve salva dilatation, and severe central aortic valve regurgitation. He was referred for surgical repair, and that's where I met him in the operating room. So we can see here, overall, um, you see a very subtle amount of aortic valve regurgitation with uh, essentially kind of torrential flow back into the LV and a very dilated sinus of valve salva. This sinus of, I'm sorry, this is the bicuspid valve. Again, you can see this partial fusion here with a raffe and again, extensive regurgitation. And his sinus of Valsalva measured 79 millimeters with a normal medicine in aorta. So this is a patient with bicuspid aortic valve and bicuspid aerotopathy. So 30 to 80 percent of 30 to 80 percent of patients with a bicuspid valve will have some degree of aortic dilatation, and this is independent of valvular stenosis. So there have been some proposed mechanisms of some jet from the bicuspid valve leading to more rapid expansion of the mid aorta, but when you look at these patients' aortas under a microscope, they aren't normal, regardless of the fact that whether or not they had a lot of uh, aortic valve stenosis or regurgitation. Routine imaging is necessary, and typically we do need to screen their first degree relatives. Um, one of the things that I've been struck by in the valve clinic is I'll see a patient with bicuspid valve who's seen people for years about this bicuspid valve, and I told them, hey, so have your kids been screened yet? And they say, what? Um, so there's about a 20% risk of passing on a bicuspid valve and aerotopathy to your kids. Um, so I think it's really important that we address that as cardiologists because some of these patients present at age 20 with a synenarytic aneurysm or dissection, and we don't want their kids to miss the boat. Lastly, dissection is more common, uh, sorry, is uh, more common in the general population, but still rare. 
um, and we intervene at 55 millimeters or earlier if they have a need for aortic valve replacement or family history. So this is my last slide here. Basically, um, for patients with a degenerative aneurysm, 55 millimeters, including those patients with a bicuspid aortic valve, um, smaller diameters for inherited aerotopathies, again, 50 millimeters for Marfans and 40 millimeters for Lois Dietz.